from the Cube Studios in Palo Alto and Boston, bringing you data-driven insights from the Cube and ETR. This is Breaking Analysis with Dave Vellante. Oracle Corporation is seeing renewed business momentum that is being powered by a combination of an entrenched legacy database business, years of investment in cloud infrastructure, an integrated application suite and AI technologies that are being infused throughout its product line. Now this includes autonomous database, 23 AI, Exadata, Exascale, and other Oracle infrastructure and its vast applications portfolio. Oracle has a highly differentiated strategy that is hitting on most, if not all cylinders, and it appears the best is yet to come. It's one reason that year to date, the stock is up 54% compared to the NASDAQ, which is up 19% as of this recording. Hello, and welcome to this week's The Cube Research Insights, powered by ETR. In this breaking analysis, Rob Stretche and I break down our analysis of Oracle Cloud World held this week in Las Vegas. We're going to share highlights from the event. We'll examine the firm's differentiated stack and look at some survey data from ETR that supports our thesis. Before we get into it, let's take a snapshot of Oracle's earnings momentum. Here's a screenshot of the company's income statement from last quarter with our rough estimates of what the full fiscal year will look like. CEO Safra Katz was very proud of the fact that Oracle's first fiscal quarter ended on August 31st, and they released earnings with guidance on Tuesday, September 10th. That's five business days after the quarter ended when you take out the weekends and the Monday holiday, which is quite remarkable and definitely best in class in the business. Now, I don't wanna go through all this data in detail, but I do wanna highlight a few points. Oracle's top line revenue came in at just over 13 billion for the quarter at an 8% growth rate relative to last year's Q1. And our estimate is that their business is accelerating and they'll end up doing $58 billion in revenue this fiscal year. That's a 9% growth rate overall relative to fiscal year 24. And the reason is shown in red, a remaining performance obligation, RPO of 99 billion. That's up 52%. So this when you combine it with a CapEx spend of $14 billion, which primarily is for data center buildouts, is what's giving investors a lot of enthusiasm about Oracle's future. Now, moving into some of the critical line items of the business, we see Oracle's SaaS business coming in at between 14 to 15 billion this year, and an IaaS business at 10 billion, growing in the 40% range. You know, last quarter, Oracle said its OCI consumption revenue increased 56%, and that's down from the mid-60s, so still very high you know, relative to last quarter, that's sequentially. And it continued expected high rates throughout the year. Now, just for context, context, an IaaS business of $10 billion, that puts Oracle still behind Alibaba, which is probably going to come in at about $13 billion this year, and about only 10% of the size of Amazon's IaaS business. But if you include SaaS plus IaaS, it's a business that's about $25 billion compared to Google's combined IaaS and SaaS business at about $40 billion this year. So in, a, in that sense, it's getting pretty sizable. Still a distance from the big hyperscalers, but closing in with a faster growth rate. Now, what's frankly more interesting is not the comparison with other clouds, but rather the profitability of its business. We expect Oracle to finish its fiscal year with around a 44% operating margin. This is Microsoft-level operating margin. Think about Amazon Web Services last quarter. It was about 35% operating margin. So this is a highly profitable business. It's trailing 12-month cash flow. is running at $19 billion on an operating basis and $11 billion in free cash flow. All of this leading to a valuation of $440 billion. So this is an incredible business. And I have little doubt that Larry Ellison wants to get to a trillion-dollar valuation and is investing, is investing to do so. Okay, with that as background, Cloud World, formerly Open World, there were about there were more than 20,000 people, maybe 25,000 attendees. And the big news there was the AWS partnership, which we're showing here, and you can see my tweet about time. We had Matt Garman on stage, it was all lovey-dovey. They had a joint customer who was the CTO of State Street. And then after this session, Larry declared the start of the multi-cloud era which is classic Larry. He loves to take a trend that has been around for a while, reimagine it, 
and then put out a highly differentiated strategy and declare that the thing is now real, i.e. he created it. But his multi-cloud strategy is unique. We're going to talk about that. And in our view, one of the strongest, if not the strongest, in the infrastructure cloud business. And we're going to talk about that. Larry talked about two things in his keynotes. Multi-cloud and security was the other topic. I absolutely loved his messaging here. He said, let me tell you, we're done with passwords. The idea is utterly ridiculous. They're easily hacked. The more difficult they are to remember, the more likely you are to write them down, the more likely they are to be stolen. Everything done to make passwords better has made them worse. It's a terrible idea. So we're getting rid of passwords entirely. This is the, the, the way you're going to log on to, to work. I'm going to type in Larry.ellison at oracle.com. The computer is going to look at me and say, okay, hi, Larry, we're done. Why would I type? Safra can recognize me. My kids can recognize me. You're telling me a computer can't recognize me and log me in? This is ridiculous. So that was both hilarious and it rings true. And he talked about four pillars of security, data, application, user identity, and network, and how you can't have, a, have great security without full automation. Rob, I want to bring you into the conversation. This was a, a big event. Lots of suits, lots of CIOs, lots of deals going down, tons of content. It was kind of a fire hose, similar to AWS reInvent. Take us through your thoughts on the event, the AWS partnership, Oracle's multi-cloud strategy, any other impressions you want to share. Yeah, so I think overall the event was, I thought, fantastic. I thought the message was right on when you talk about the multi-cloud and multi-cloud era, like you said, been around for a bit, but I think they take it from a different place because they have been a systems vendor. They, you know, they own Sun, they bought Sun, you know, some years ago, and really they build the infrastructure like Exadatas and Exascale, and they have real technology when they talk about Gen 2 hy hyperscaler. So what I thought was they really hit on a lot of the different pieces that have been uh, nagging at them for a while to get out there because they're really an engineering company. So getting out there and getting the message out and getting above because they don't like to hype too much. So, I, you know, don't overhype things. And I think they really did a good job of not overhyping. But like you said, the AWS partnership and having Matt Garman on stage with State Street um, the thing that rang true to me was that they've leaned into this multi-cloud world and optionality. That that it was in the press release around that, and Fidelity was quoted there around optionality and how people are going to be able to build these next-gen applications. But a lot of the data right now is inside Oracle databases, and they had a lot talking about how they're going to unravel that and allow you to be more usable. But again. Being in that opinionated stack was really interesting. Uh, I think, again, they're, they're really, I think, leaning into that, hey, we're going to grow and this is how we're going to grow. We're not going to do it the same that Amazon. We're not going to do it the same that Google or Azure did. We're actually going to take a different tact to how we do this. And I thought, and you know, walking around the show floor, was impressed with the number of partners that were there, not just the GSIs, which you expect to be there because of the SaaS apps and the HCM and ERP, but was also a lot of the other vendors that were there that are leaning in to be you know, dedicated regions or using Alloy, which is their other term for cloud, uh, you know, somebody else's premise in multi-tenant. I, th I think they really have a strong story to go to those partners, especially with what's happening with VMware, I think in that context, this actually, you know, was a pretty good play for them. And we can get into, we'll get into some more details in a little bit though. Yeah, the Sun acquisition, glad you mentioned that, it was transformative. They paid uh, seven and a half billion dollars roughly net of cash for Sun and turned it into a, you know, massive cloud business. And you, you can still see when you look at their income statement, there's a line item for hardware and Solaris and 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 is still in there, and even storage tech uh, tape libraries are still in there. All right, and I think people are going to laugh at your comment that uh, they don't like to overhype, uh, especially given less of a Larry's uh, uh, yeah. pit, oh. pitch master. But at any rate, let's move right along and take a look at Oracle's what Rob called an opinionated stack. So sorry about this picture. We still don't have all the slides from Oracle. They're a little bit understandably busy, but this picture essentially describes the red stack. I like to call it. It's a complete end-to-end -end portfolio 
with some gaps that we're going to talk about, that, but it spans infrastructure with OCI, Oracle Cloud Infrastructure, a very strong suite of applications that call Fusion apps. It took them a decade plus to, to get that right, but they're tightly integrated in a host of third-party applications. Fusion Data Intelligence, we're going to, again, talk about that as an area where we think they need to do a little bit more work. And at the top of the stack, industry applications, like this big acquisition of Cerner, which is kind of one of Larry's new babies, with AI infused throughout the picture, all supported by both Oracle and third-party services, mainly from GSIs like Accenture and Deloitte. Rob, this level of integration is uncommon in the industry, and Oracle's very proud of the work it has done with Autonomous Database that, that came throughout the week. We heard about that. And, of course, in Larry's keynote, where um, it basically, all this allows, as you said, Oracle to tell a pretty strong story, doesn't it? Yeah, I think it does. I think that when you look at that opinionated stack, it is from the apps all the way down. I think the only only company you could say that really from the hyperscalers that could lean in like that is really Microsoft with Office. And I, I think that when you, but theirs are so much broader in the verticals that they touch and within those verticals, what organ, parts of the organization they touch, that it, it, is, it is really sticky for them. I thought what was also really interesting is using that opinionated stack on the way up, they're building the AI in from the ground up, from the bottom of the stack all the way up. So using their own AI, and one of the things they were talking about, and I really, you know, uh, Steve Miranda talked about this was, do people really care what foundation model we're using underneath Fusion? No, they don't. They, what they care about is that it's accurate, that there's no hallucinations, that it's grounded on the right data, that is fine-tuned on their data, and that it's private and secure. And they just want to be able to use it. I think that they really hit on something that, I thought they were uniquely positioned. And I like the fact that they said, you know, we may pull out and, you know, put a different foundation model in under the hood. And the customer from a CX perspective shouldn't care. And I thought that was a, a huge piece to it was that they really are working backwards from the, the customer in that way on those applications on the Fusion apps to really help organizations utilize and get a lot of value out of AI. And you know, when you're talking about uh, differentiation relative to, you, you mentioned Microsoft, but I would say, when you think about Oracle's differentiation, they're different from Microsoft because they really, Oracle focuses on the most mission critical applications. Um, and frankly, they have stronger security, really focused on security. Look at AWS, they've got a really bespoke portfolio. They don't have, you know, up the stack apps like Oracle. Remember Oracle went out, and they basically hired Charles Phillips to re-architect their their portfolio and start buying all these application companies like PeopleSoft and others, Siebel, et cetera. You know, Google has the security, but it doesn't have the enterprise apps. It, you know, it's got some, you know, workflow or work, work group productivity stuff, but certainly doesn't have the mission critical apps. SAP doesn't have the, the underlying cloud infrastructure. IBM definitely, you know, not as integrated as Oracle is as, and has a much bigger services business that it relies on. So highly differentiated from those companies yeah. and its competition. I mean, just think about it. There was actually two fl show floors. There was Sweet World next door at Caesars uh, Forum. Uh, and I, I think that, you know, you had all of Venetian uh, rented out. I, I think it was pretty impressive at how they bring that together and the different personas. Now, I think it was a little wonky that you had to take a bus between the two, but uh, other than that, <laughs> other than, than solving for that and maybe having MGM's uh, CEO on stage at the Venetian is a little tell about what, what they're going to be doing maybe with Mandalay or something like that. That was interesting. Yeah. Uh, Stafford said, hey, we look forward to having open world or cloud world at yeah. MGM someday. So maybe they're uh, signaling yeah. something or maybe that they're going to tie it into a bigger deal. Okay, let's move along. Everyone is trying to get AI right. There are a lot of questions right now about embedded AI or bespoke. And you know when are we going to see the payback? You hear about that every day on, on the, the business programs. You know, what's the ROI? And when are we going to get a return on all this CapEx? Ellison summed it up on the earnings call this week. And I, and I couldn't agree more for an established company with an application portfolio like Oracle's. He said, AI is just, I, I don't know how to describe it. I mean, the best way to describe it is it's not something that you sell separately. It's the diagnostic system. It's the electronic health record system. 
It's the pharmacy system, the prescription system, the user authentication, the login system. It's all AI. And I know people think it's a separate thing. Oh my God. And I hear a bunch of applications come say, oh, we've now got AI agents and we're going to charge for that separately. I mean, it's, look, our applications are going to be primarily AI applications, everything. How do you charge separately for everything? I really don't. I find it bewildering when I listen to them talk. I don't understand what they're saying. Then Larry stopped and said, you know, we wonder, and, and, and I'll stop there. And so that was really kind of, uh, first of all, he's taking a shot at Microsoft, who's charging, you know, to arm and a leg through co-pilots. Um, but he's right. It's just going to be there. You're going to get it, and you're going to pay for it because it's valuable. In, in, in fact, Steve Miranda doubled down on that in, in another uh, another meeting we were able to go to with him and he he really looked at it and said listen i don't think our customers are really concerned about what our margins on these applications are that's our concern if we want to go and give ai as part of those applications we should be able to do that and we're not going to because people think they can charge for it i think that was a strong play that they they're pushing in on and really you know putting on notice people like google and uh, Microsoft in that way, and even Amazon to a lesser extent with Q as well. Well, and of course, in the case of Google, and to a certain extent, Microsoft with its $10 billion you know, investment in open AI, it's got to get a payback because they're building all these LLMs. You know, the, the bigger LLMs get, the more expensive they get. You don't get the marginal economics necessarily like you do in software. Right. And he's like, hey, we're not building LLMs. I, I asked... Um, I asked Juan Loiza at the database summit, are you guys ever going to build M uh, LLMs? He goes, look, you know, Larry makes the call, but right now I don't think so. I mean, that's a big, that, you know, throwing a hundred billion dollars at that stuff. It doesn't sound like something we're going to do. All right, let's move on to uh, OCI, Oracle Cloud Infrastructure, and focus on the IS level. Oracle always emphasizes that it's good at building data centers. Larry in the earnings call gave a mini masterclass on what it takes to build a data center or data centers generally and power sources specifically talked about a gigawatt data center that they're going to be building soon and nuclear power plants that are proximate to that data center and essentially dedicated to powering that data center. And we saw this slide from Oracle's Clay McGorick, uh, who's the EVP of OCI. Clay in his keynote uh, said that Oracle has 59 regions planned and live. Larry on the earnings call said, we now have 85 cloud regions live and another 77 planned with more to follow. Regardless, they're building out data centers. So there's always some confusion, whether it's Microsoft claiming region leadership, Amazon explaining its availability zones and how that sort of is not an apples to apples comparison. Oracle always talking about its, its regions, but a couple of things, Rob. Well, add some clarity. You have done some work on this, to this equation. And how do you think about Oracle cloud infrastructure? They've got a lot of all this GPU capacity and an NVIDIA rate relationship for training uh, and AI. And generally, what's your thought on the quality of, of OCI relative to other clouds? Yeah, I, I think, again, where you talked about them leaning in on security, I think they are, you know, everybody says they were late to the game and they were, but that did enable them to build a very opinionated single stack that could be moved around, which is when they talked about uh, dedicated region 25, or we'll, we'll act, or, you know, little numbers up top, which I couldn't get my computer to do in my tweet. But when you start to look at dedicated region 25, it's still three 42 inch racks. So when they talk about going small and small in a region, you know, we saw this with Outposts. Outposts went through a thing where it was 40, you know, you had to buy one rack, 42U, and that was that first Outpost. Then they came out with a 1U and a 2U starter kit kind of thing, server, get some EC2 instances up and running, some EBS and maybe some S3. I don't know that the, the dedicated uh, region is really focused on the same problem that Amazon was trying to solve with Outposts. And that hyper-converged really solves for, you know, kind of that hybrid cloud and multi-cloud for organizations. They're more looking at things like, hey, you're using Oracle, I'm going to bring the OCI infrastructure with our Kubernetes stack, with Oracle Linux, with all of these different pieces underneath the hood, plus autonomous or uh, 23AI and the databases and a really opinionated stack to you so that you can build out on top of it. And I think they have a, a strong play to really kind of carve off 
those applications that are utilizing things like autonomous and building applications on top of it. So I don't think you, you know, I don't think many companies are really focused on the Oracle stack just because of it being a hyperscaler. I would say that they're looking at it because they have another tie-in to one of the other applications, would be it Fusion, be it some of the uh, different pieces from the database stack, or even as you look into the future, and we'll talk, touch on this, I'm sure later, that the, the data lake stack uh, that is still you know, burgeoning for them. But I think they're, they're really looking at this underlying piece uh, in a good way for what they're trying to do and how they're trying to get at it. In fact, having people like uh, Fujitsu on stage was really impressive. But when you look at it, that slide had, you know, 80, 80 different regions that were lit up. So, you know, close to the 89 that was talked about, and I'm sure some were, you know, updated as it was going along. What was really interesting was that there were still 24 more at Azure regions to be turned on. There was another 14 at Google. So they have seven lit at Azure now. They have four with Google. And they have, you know, roughly 38 more regions coming online. So I think this is really smart for them. Why go and try to find all these different locations with centers of gravity when you can just have, be a sidecar onto these other regions? And, oh, by the way, they're bringing their full stack there. So it's their gear. It's their security. It's their cloud at Azure. And they're tying the, the two together. So they're tying their security in with Azure security or with Google's so that it's single authentication. They're putting it in, they're doing the work to look like a first party service in the different marketplaces and consoles. I think it's a really smart move. Oracle was the first company, at least on paper, to actually truly put out a, a, a true hybrid cloud where the on-prem infrastructure and the experience was identical to what is in the public cloud. They were really the first to do that. No other company um, has really done as good a job. Now it took them a while to get there because their cloud was kind of iffy and you know maybe still has some gaps, but it's, it's pretty world-class now. But that with cloud at customer was sort of unique. And so the only difference in what's in the various regions and inside of their partners like AWS, Google, and, and Microsoft is the size. So they can scale it down, they can have, the, even their sovereign clouds are identical. It's the same exact stack. So that homogeneity is very powerful um, and something that we really, that's, that's part of the reason why in our view, they have maybe one of the best, if not the best, from an infrastructure standpoint, and obviously they can move up the stack, of, multi-cloud strategies, it, it actually is a form of super cloud because of that, the identical nature of all that. And then the other question I have for you, you mentioned hyperscaler, are they a hyperscaler? I think they are. I think, again, they are selling IaaS. I mean, they, they had uh, several, you know, uh, Chris had several different organizations on stage with him that were looking at how they were using the raw, the raw components, the raw compute, the raw uh, Kubernetes stack, the raw storage stack, and doing things like rendering. Uh, so they had, you know, again, a nice little, uh, you know, advertisement for a new Netflix uh, show that's coming out from one of their customers and how it was all rendered there and all rendered in OCI. So they're chipping away at these different use cases that have typically been uh, IaaS, you know, hey, I, I just need servers where I can put my rendering software on and that's my intellectual property about how fast I can go and how I orchestrate it and how I do the media management and things of that nature. Uh, I think they're doing a really good job at uh, having those core components while leaning on what their core differentiator is, which is the database and the up stack applications. So again, you're seeing this theme of highly differentiated. Let's get into some of the content from Juan Loeza who's the executive vice president of Mission Critical Database at Oracle. This is sort of the wheelhouse. And we can also touch on uh, Nip and Agarwal's turf. He's the senior vice president of MySQL Heatwave, which is, you know, continues to set the world on fire, no pun intended. But the most interesting thing to many of us at the event was not just the AWS relationship. That was cool. It was nice. It was kind of expected eventually. But rather this idea of duality, being able to unify SQL, JSON, and graph data in a single platform and 
in his keynote uh, presentation, Juan gave the example of a gaming application that required three distinct data types around athletes, events, and attendees, kind of showing that conceptually here, all requiring different data with different formats that needs to be harmonized. He went deep into these, and, and you know, Juan, <laughs> Juan can go deep. He's highly technical and, and can, you know, understands nuance, you know, understands the developer environment. But Rob, maybe take us through what this concept of duality is. How unique is it and, and why is it important? Yeah, I think, again, we talk about a lot harmonization. How do you bring things together? And I, I think a lot of it is really uh, how do you build the people, places, and things and understand how they all tie back together. What they've done here is in the 23AI database where duality lives uh, to begin with right now, they've really enabled vector uh graph and any type or data type that you want in a database. So be it a content, be it regular SQL, what have you, they're enabling people to bring these all together and hiding the complexity of getting that to be into the JSON. So what they're doing there is important because the graph portion of the database becomes that API interface to the JSON. And why that's important is they had this uh, idea of JSON duality views, which anybody who's been a DBA, which that's where I started my life, you, you love views because you can go and change things underneath that view as long as you don't change them you know, too extremely, you can actually go and do that. So they use the example of, hey, I wanna go from a single, you know, hey, this is a pick region, you know, blah, uh, you, know, you know, Frankfurt. And I now have added eight more regions how do I take that into a dropdown? Well, I go and just change the JSON to be a dropdown box, and behind the view, it changes automatically the actual data that feeds in there. So I don't have to do a lot of re-engineering or data engineering. It's automatically done in that duality view. That is a huge time saver to organizations that are trying to build these data apps, as we talk about. And so you can build your data, you know, data features and data products on the duality view, and then go and based on the relational duality, use that all the way up, and you know the JSON becomes smart. It's a smart JSON, which I think for organizations, to your point about a hyperscaler, that's where the devs want to live. And I he called it Gen Dev, which I loved. Yeah. I, I I was like, that's actually a really good way of putting this. Uh, I think there's other things they're doing with AI and Copilot like stuff with Apex. Uh, that ties into this, uh, that will be really, really interesting to see. But again, if you're using that 23 AI stack, this becomes really powerful for you. Yeah, and, and that harmonization is important, and especially important when we get to sort of agents, and we'll talk about that. But real quick, Heatwave continues to put out new innovations and performance breakthroughs. A anything that struck you there? Yeah, I, I think, again, with Heatwave, it was, again, the different types and how they're bringing data together, how they were really looking uh, to bring, I guess you could say, the different pieces and bridge them. And it, it becomes kind of the glue uh, amongst them with the you know autonomous database and all of those pieces as well. And I think they're trying to bring that all together. So I, I think the, you know, the performance that they're looking at getting was also uh, impressive. There wasn't a huge amount uh, talked about with he made, but I think, you know, again, that's a space that I'm sure they're going to be making a lot of noise in the coming months. All right, let's take a look at Oracle's data analytics and data lake strategies where we do see some gaps where Oracle needs to catch up. But again, the company has a different approach where the analytics are embedded in the red stack and tightly integrated. This slide here highlights that from a high level of perspective, including integration with Salesforce, which I believe is new. They even announced it this week. Of course, Salesforce is running Oracle, which Maybe simplifies that, but Rob, the appeal of this is this unified data and metadata model and very tightly integrated with the full Oracle stack, the databases, the fusion apps. It's got Apex, the development environment, supporting the picture. How do you see this compared to other platforms? And where, in your view, are the gaps? How does it fit with all the work we do around Snowflake and Databricks, the open source governance movement, and the open tables format moment? Yeah, I, I think, again, they, this is a place where they were maybe, to your point about uh, 
putting the cart in front of the horse on their marketing, they got out a little bit and they had a little one slide on, on data lakes that I wish we, we could find. <laughs> well, I'm sure we'll find it over in the coming, the coming week here, but they really looked at, you know, hey, you can use Iceberg, Delta, uh, Hootie, and all these different formats. So they were leaning into, like you said, the open uh, data formats. I think what was interesting is there was a lot of uh, substance or users behind that yet because it's still not GA. They're looking to GA it in 2025. So they're starting to do preview of their data lake concept. Um, it's gonna be tied very tightly to aut autonomous, I would say, just based on all of the other pieces they talked about in there. And all the way up, I think, again, this goes back to, they can build that opinionated stack, whereas others like Databricks are saying, you build your data apps on top of us. Here you have, you can build your data apps you can also use our packaged apps. It can all consume from the same data. And I think that was a big piece of what they were doing with this is how do I bring all of this data together from the Fusion apps, from Salesforce, like you said, because I, I think they look at it and you know that's one of their major competitors from a CRM perspective uh, with some of the NetSuite stuff and others that they have out there. And they also have the HCM and ERP apps. So I, I think, again, when you start to look at that, portion, I think it made a lot of sense for them to talk about the analytics, but the analytics were really tied more directly into how you use AI to simplify the data within the database and, hey, I want to be able to explore the data. So how do you get around people like Salesforce who has Tableau where, you know, okay, I want to build these dashboards inside of one of my other apps here. And I, I think that's really, re really leaning in on the AI and the Apex developer platform to help them with that. And, and they've got, you know, governance, they've got their own the catalog, of course, inside of the Red Stack, but they're, from what we could tell in sort of private conversations, their strategy is to be sort of the catalog of catalogs, uh, where ultimately, in, in a similar to Microsoft Purview, they'll they'll push down to those other catalogs. They're also going to get dragged in to the open table format wars. Uh, we'll see whether or not they contribute to, to to some of that open source, whether it's Unity or Polaris. That remains to be seen. There was certainly no statements of direction there. I think they're still trying to figure that all out. Yeah, and I, I think one of the comments that was a uh, hallway conversation about it was, do you think people would actually have Oracle manage their data, their metadata catalog across Snowflake and Databricks and things like that. And their, their comment was no. And so here we're going to lean into these other things. And like you said, I think they have a lot of uh, figuring out to do still in this space. I think this is the gap, the governance and uh, how they tie into kind of that global governance. But they did have announcements with people like Informatica that was there. So again, leaning on partners and not cutting out ISVs out of that, where we're starting to see that with Databricks and with uh, you know people like Snowflake, where it, it is our stack. Yes, we have ISVs, but you know again, they have they've, they've left some air in the room for others. Well, and we got to go beyond sort of just serving up dashboards, uh, BI dashboards, and that's where we're going to go to the top of the stack and take a look at. Some of what Oracle is doing that's that's novel, particularly around agents. Sorry, this is the best slide I could get. Pulled it from Steve Miranda's keynote. He's the EVP of applications at Oracle, and this is really important. We, we've said that the entire application stack is going to change. Um, but five years from now, ten years from now, it's going to look completely different. A lot of people are talking about co-pilots and single agents, but the really exciting trend is multi-agent platforms that are working with each other in concert, guided by top-down goals at performing defined business tasks and automating workflows end to end. And Steve gave an example of how multiple agents will work together inside of Oracle with authority and access to do the jobs that humans have historically done. And last year at Cloud World, he promised Oracle would have more than 50 use cases for AI, which they displayed. Uh, and this year he promised that they will deliver more than 50 agents by next year. And it's hard to see, but in there, our agents, things for like planning and project management, policy advisors, service request uh, certifiers, work order assessments, and dozens of other AI machines doing things that humans have historically done. Rob, when Larry talks about a 10 to 20x improvement in productivity, this is where the rubber meets the road, so to speak. And if you can 
have trusted, governed, and harmonized data connected across an application portfolio so that operational analytic data are not siloed. You can begin to build what you talked about earlier, digital representation of an organization that can respond to change in real time, like the Uber app for an enterprise that translates data living in strings and turns it into what you were saying, you know, digital people, places, and things that can be organized to create a business outcome. What would you add to this picture? Yeah, I, I think again, when you start to look at it and where they're starting, they're starting in their, uh, where their bread and butter is in the knitting around the Fusion apps and being able to, again, show people like, hey, there's a, a ledger agent. So that goes into, hey, here's how I, you know, do my finance. And they talk about it. this is how they actually are able to achieve their getting their quarterly numbers out in such a short time frame is using these agents to really go through that price change assistant. So you start to look at the tasks and we know agents, most people think of agents as doing a singular task, collections of agents do an activity. They also talked about the fact that they look at it as building these as assistants. And not, you know, they went beyond calling them, you know, co-pilots, which was great. I, I think because they're they're actually doing a certain task, you know, like I said, order import assistant. Very defined. Like Very defined yeah. tasks, which is what we agree to is that over time, you'll have the collection of these working in coordination and that. It also builds off of the fact that if I'm looking at Oracle and back to are they a hyperscaler, are they have all the pieces they have this very opinionated stack that you can take in very easily. And you can, they have experience building these agents. So not only have they gone out and built the infrastructure from the foundation models on up, you know, GPUs on up for that matter, uh, and storage on up, but they've also built the hard stuff, the logic and other things. So I, I look at this as if I'm looking at AI they gave me 50 plus re reasons to go and have a conversation with them. Maybe I'm not gonna go build it there, but at least they become part of the conversation because I know they can build these and they're building it on the infrastructure and they're not gonna do it and sell it in a way to their margin conversation that Steve brought up. I'm gonna go and assume that they really didn't hurt their margins by putting AI into these Fusion apps. In fact, they probably look at it as, helping with their NRR and all of these other pieces to bring people in and speed the work that those organizations and help their NPS score, which again, they, they talked about more than I thought they would talk about because everybody, you know, likes to hate on them, which, you know, it's kind of a side game, but you know, the NPS score is pretty, was pretty well, good. It's true. We're talking right. about, I mean, people love to trash Oracle. They're the company that, you know, they gouge us with pricing, they lock us in, et cetera. But you talk to customers, they're like, look, there's value there. I mean, you saw, you were there, you talked to a number of customers this week and they're there for a reason. They drive value. They're, it was senior level audience. All right, let's close with some data from ETR and Oracle spending profiles. Alex, if you bring up the, the first of two charts here, um, this is, for those of you familiar with breaking analysis, you've seen this many times. This is the core methodology around net score. It's a measure of spending momentum within a platform. This particular slide shows Oracle's full portfolio. You can see we select it all from Fusion Apps, NetSuite, Analytics, all the way down to OCI and everything else in, in the portfolio. We've got a large N of 861 out of about 1800 in this survey. We have to block out October. That's a survey that's just in the field right now. Um, but 861 is a really good one. Net score of 15.6%, which is the percent of customers out of that 861 that are uh, adding the platform new, 4%, that's the lime green. Spending more, 23%, that's the forest green. Spending flat, plus or minus 5%, that's the gray. Spending down 6% or worse, 15%, that's the pink. And then 8% are churning subtract the reds from the greens and you get net score of 15.6% shown on that blue line there, which is, you know, cl clearly showing some momentum. 40% is a highly elevated net score. So a legacy company like Oracle will have a big fat middle in the gray, which penalizes net score. But, and that yellow line, by the way, is the percentage of, 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 of mentions for the customer or uh, in, in, the, in the data set as a percentage of the total N. Um, so you can see it's tailing off a bit, but still very, very high for Oracle. They get a huge presence. The interesting thing about this chart is 
the way you can see the green steadily progressing and the red, red wants to go down more. It's good to see the, the bright red, you know, going much lower. Not surprising that the gray is, is, uh, is the fattest part of those bars. Uh, but this is a positive picture. If you go on to the next slide, Alex, this is just Oracle Cloud Computing, which is obviously whatever the client thinks it is, whatever the respondent thinks it is. A lot of OCI in there. They still still got some legacy situations in there. So you can see it's all over the place. You see it bounced up in the January and April 22 survey and then sort of rocketed back down. And I think they're just, you know, blowing out some of the um, the earlier you know, versions. Now we're into the, I think there's sort of a third generation of Oracle Cloud of OCI. And you can see it's headed in the right direction um, with, uh, uh, and I apologize, the net score in the previous slide, I said 15.6%. It's actually was lower. It was uh, like around 5%, which is kind of low for, for Oracle's overall business for the reasons I described. I'll correct that. But it jumps up to 15, it triples relative to the overall, you know, uh, average of the portfolio. And so that's a very positive sign, but the, you can see that blue line here, Rob, uh, moving in in the right direction. The yellow line, look, they're they're up against a lot of other cloud competition, so there are a lot of cloud choices there, but very clearly, as we described at the top, uh, Oracle's got some momentum as a business. I'll give you the final thought. Yeah, I, I think it, it's true, and I think everything they did this week really was to continue that momentum and help give reasons for people to take another look, especially if you already have a spend with Oracle and most organizations, you know, large organizations do. I think you also look at how they're attacking the service provider market, uh, like Fujitsu, who was on stage with them for those regional and those sovereign clouds. And I, I think it's huge. I think they got, I think it's a great play. All right, Rob, I know you got to go. Thank you so much for, for joining me here. Uh, we're really excited about uh, about the innovations that we saw this week and how they're going to apply and, and relate to the rest of the industry. Okay, that's it for now. Thanks to Alex Meyerson and Ken Schiffman on production and on our podcast, and Kristen Martin and Cheryl Knight help get the word out on social media and in our newsletters. Rob Hof is our EIC over at Silicon Angle, and thank you all. Remember, all these episodes are available as podcasts wherever you listen. Just search Breaking Analysis Podcast. We publish each week on thecuberesearch.com and siliconangle.com. You got an idea, you want to pitch us, email david.vellante at siliconangle.com or DM me at dvellante. Comment on our LinkedIn post and check out etr.ai. They get the best survey data in the enterprise tech business. This is Dave Vellante for Rob Streche for the Cube Research Insights powered by ETR. Thanks for watching, everybody. We'll see you next time on Breaking Analysis.